Coach Ray Meyer planned his strategy in a desperate effort to contain Bird. But it was Bird who scored the opening basket of the second half for Indiana State. DePaul struggled to get going. Their first score coming on Mark Aguirre's turnaround jumper at the 58 second mark. Almost another minute passed before the Blue Demons were able to score again. They worked the ball into Aguirre. He rammed it home. The next four minutes belonged to DePaul. The big surge started with a basket by Aguirre, who was the nation's highest scoring freshman in 79. Along the way, Bird scored one more time, and significantly, it would be his last basket of the game. Less than six minutes to go, and there was no stopping Aguirre. With his layup, the ball trailed by only two. Now with a chance to tie it up, Ray Meyer instructed the Blue Demons to take their time. They did, and Aguirre's turnaround jumper tied it, 71 all. DePaul then forced Indiana State into a turnover. Clyde Bradshaw stole the ball, and Gary Garland put the Blue Demons ahead for the first time in the second half. Now it was anybody's ball game. The winner would beat Michigan State in the finals to determine the 1979 NCAA champion. DePaul had an opportunity to increase its lead to four points, but here they committed one of their few turnovers in the game, a crucial mistake. Indiana State scored the tying basket on a marvelous pass from Bird to Bob Heaton. The ball jumped in front 74 to 73 on a free throw. But another Heaton layup put Indiana State back on top 75 to 74. Only 36 seconds left on the clock. The ball down by one point called a timeout. Ray Meyer explained his strategy. The ball was to get the ball in low to Aguirre. If that didn't work, to take the first good shot. Now here's what happened. Indiana State forced Aguirre outside, where he was immediately confronted by Miley and Nix. He had to take an almost impossible shot from the deep corner. It bounced off the rim to Leroy Staley of Indiana State, who was fouled with one second left. The Sycamores were confident of victory as they hugged each other in celebration. Staley went on to make the free throw, putting Indiana State ahead 76 to 74. And now DePaul needed a miracle. But it didn't happen. Their full court desperation pass was easily broken up, and the game was over. The Sycamores had lifted their record to 33 and 0 and moved into the finals. Ray Meyer and Bill Hodges congratulated each other. It was a terrific ball game. Indiana State fans thoroughly enjoyed their favorite victory song. Then, some 48 hours later, DePaul was involved in another thriller. The game for third place with the Pennsylvania Quakers. The Quakers sent that battle into overtime on a jumper by James Salters. Pennsylvania had overcome a 23-point deficit to tie it up. And then, in the five-minute overtime period, Mark Aguirre scored eight of his game-high 34 points in leading to Paul to an exciting 96-93 victory. Michigan State against Indiana State, both teams seeking their first national title in basketball. The game was billed as the showcase for two of the nation's best players. Smooth and gifted Larry Bird of Indiana State, everybody's player of the year. A unanimous selection on five All-America teams. In the other corner, Urban Magic Johnson, the great one from Michigan State. The Magic Man had also made five All-America teams. He was confident about Michigan State winning this game. I don't scout people. I don't like to watch games because I know if we do the things we can do best, if we run our offense, we play our defense, then no team in the country can uh, handle Michigan State. The Spartans were an explosive team. Irvin Johnson triggered the attack in so many different ways. Here, he grabs a rebound. Drives the length of the court, exhibiting the extraordinary skills that made him such a delight to watch. And after scoring, he responds in typical Johnson style. Well, Johnson
Johnson was performing his magic tricks, Larry Bird tried to crack Michigan State's zone defense with his outside shooting. He was fouled on this play, much to the displeasure of the Michigan State bench. Coach Jed Heathcote was upset, and so with the game less than four minutes old, the Spartans unexpectedly called a timeout. We thought that perhaps we were forcing the ball a little too much. We were surprised to uh, see the bird on uh, Gregory Kelzer, and I think Greg reacted with the idea that he would drive the basket and use his quickness. And uh, we thought, hey, we better slow it down just a little bit, make sure that the shot is there, the pass is there, and take advantage of the fact that uh, Larry Bird was defensing Gregory Kelzer. And Greg in that game became more of a passer. And that's for sure. Kelser set up this basket on a fine pass to Terry Donnelly. Greg Kelser's overall performance in the first half played a major role in the Spartan success. Here, he drives around Bird and scores on a left-handed layup. On defense, Kelser was the key in helping contain Bird. He explained his assignment this way. Well, the thing that I had to do was when he came on my side of the zone, I had to definitely be aware of his presence. And when he got the ball, I had to be right there in his face. Uh, any shots that he was going to take were going to have to be contested. He, we couldn't let him have open shots. We also couldn't let him stand out there with the ball and throw uncontested passes so as to pick us apart. So every time he got the ball, there was somebody on him. And then when he put it down on the ground, there usually was a man and a half, maybe two men on him. From another angle, let's take a look at how much trouble Larry Bird was having trying to get open. The Spartans covered him like a blanket. And when he did get the ball, he had to force many of his shots. Nevertheless, Larry Bird worked tirelessly, trying to get free. Never in his career had he labored so hard to get a basket. into the game, Michigan State increased this lead to eight points, when Irvin Johnson banked this one in. The Spartans had set the tempo of the game. They were playing their brand of basketball, much to the satisfaction of their coach. A jumper by Carl Nix of Indiana State made it Michigan State 30, Indiana State 23. The Sycamores were trailing now by only seven, despite their inconsistency. With five minutes to go in the first half, Bill Hodges tried to restore the confidence of his players. But Michigan State continued to dominate at both ends of the court. One of the trademarks of this Michigan State team was its dazzling passing game. Before the half ended, the Spartans scored on this exciting alley-oop pass from Johnson to Kelsey. It was their favorite play, as Johnson explained. It's more or less of an uh, instinct thing where He'll look at me and, and he'll break up high real quickly. And his, if this man is on him tight or overplaying him, he go right back and I just throw it. And it always worked. Another obstacle Indiana State faced in the first half was Michigan State's scrambling, clawing defense. Oftentimes, the Sycamores got only one shot and only one rebound. You won't find better defensive play than that displayed here by Greg Kelsey. Now, that's the way to play deep. No one on the Indiana State bench was more frustrated than assistant coach Mel Daniels. And it was understandable. Michigan State had played exceptional basketball. And then, with only 14 seconds left in the half, the Spartans all of a sudden had a problem. Heading up court, Kelser bumped into Larry Bird and picked up his third personal foul. To make matters worse, Irvin Johnson also had three. And that certainly gave the Spartans something to think about at halftime. With the score 37 to 28 in favor of Michigan State.